uh, just a quick question for you, Rick, before you start. Do we know approximately how many TR cartoons there are within his own kind of world, his lifetime and immediately afterwards? And, um, and how does it rank? Where does, I know these are imprecise sciences, but how does he rank as, as, as one of the most cartooned, the most cartooned, a moderately well cartooned president? Yeah. I, f I calculated when I did Bully that I reviewed 18,000 cartoons. 18,000, so we have 3,000 so far. Yeah, not all with his face in them, but from his life and times pertinent to him or his legacy uh, afterwards. But I think he is the most, pre most cartooned president. For one thing, he was the most cartoonable f face well, uh, had a good one. to hold the office. Yeah, there were some rivals there. But, I mean, as a cartoonist looking for certain characteristics, I mean, he was irresistible, of course. Um, but then it was the perfect storm. It was at a time when a lot of magazines started and flourished, and they were illustrated magazines. Uh, so all of a sudden, who was the topic in the news magazines or humor magazines? That great character in the White House. Um, newspapers flourished. Photo engraving came to newspapers so cartoonists didn't have to scratch out chalk plates. They could draw pen and ink and the photo engraving department would put it on the front page and being a great subject so everything was the right moment for Roosevelt to be the father of young kids I and mean, everything was right. So um, Lincoln was not caricatured that often. Woodcut, not many papers. Uh, and Uncle Sam was pictured. Uh, Grant Cleveland, no, not really. Um, after Roosevelt, uh, Wilson, even FDR, even through all his years, uh, was often, the administration policy was as often depicted by Uncle Sam as by FDR. So um, that just adds up to Roosevelt. That's one more notch on his belt. Let me get out of your way. Um, Rick Marshall, Great Heart and the Great War. Please welcome our special guest. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I had a flashback before when uh, uh, Clay invited uh, people. To, anyway, it happened to me once. I was at the podium and someone said, uh, uh, Why don't you, if you want to see Rick better, come on, I'll move in front of the podium. And like everyone moved away. It was amazing. <laughs> so... We have moments of insecurity and, uh, and flashbacks. And I'm going to keep my eye on the clock because another similar thing to that was I was midway through a talk, and by way of apologizing for going on, you'll understand that, uh, I said, excuse me if I'm um, not paying attention to the schedule, but I, but I left my watch home this morning. And someone yelled out, yeah, but there's a calendar behind you. So I can take hints. And, uh, um, before I get to my notes, um, the two talks already today were so interesting and so provocative that I uh, made some notes, and I want to address them very briefly. Otherwise, I'll wake up at 3 in the morning uh, shouting that thought. And we all have that experience? Um, unfortunately with me, I usually wake up at 3 in the morning trying to order pizza or something, but the, this is about the subject here. Um, about Roosevelt's legacy, and I don't think anyone's brought this up, but I was reminded, I think this is pertinent, but when Lincoln died, as the legend goes, uh, across from Ford's theater, um, Edwin Stanton says, said, now he belongs to the ages. That is so true with Roosevelt. And uh, there's a Roosevelt we know as historians and history buffs, and the Roosevelt we think, to, think we know, and the Roosevelt we want to know. Those are three very different things, and that's part of a legacy question. And to pick one of a hundred examples of the Roosevelt we want to know, just a few years ago in the debates about uh, health care, um, President Obama and a lot of senators made the argument, and, and Obama went to uh, Osawatomi uh, to make this specifically, where new nationalism was introduced, 
um, claiming, he did this more than once, claiming that Teddy, he called him Teddy. We all know that Roosevelt said, anyone who calls me Teddy doesn't know me, so uh, you'll, <laughs> thank you. Um, but anyway, he said Teddy Roosevelt himself, a Republican, was for national health insurance. Well, he never advocated that in the new nationalism speech or speeches between then and the uh, progressive party uh, platform or the speeches. Uh, he made a confession of faith and um, social justice and the popular rule. He was for uh, industries to provide insurance and he was for the government. This is as far as he went really with the regulatory state suggesting that the government could um, establish guidelines and policies but not impose them and yet I don't know if America came to believe it or not but a lot of people did that Roosevelt was for uh, let me say this policy or that policy and it's not always the case and it's why symposiums like this and institutions and programs like this are so important because we can take away what we want and a lot of people do that um, too easily and we should do it with caution because we can't we can't play with with uh, history uh, one of the speakers talked about uh, and I know we have students here well we're all students no we're all scholars but some of us are, are still students how do you make the distinction it's how many tens of thousands of dollars a year your parents are sending to the to the school but um, I've told students a lot through the years, uh, and they ask me for advice on, on career and everything, and I have said things like, if you're a, a pre-med major, you'll go through life asking, where does it hurt? How can I make you better? And if you're a uh, law major, you'll go through life saying, how can we find justice for you in this case. Um, if you're a theology major, you go through life asking, how can I help you find God? How can we find God together? Now, if you're a history major, you go through life asking, would you like fries with that? <laughs> now, I don't mean that. Believe me, I don't mean it. I was a history major in American studies. And I make it about sociology, uh, usually <laughs> make the joke about sociology. But the point is, and we know that's why we're all here, history is very important. And we have all the sayings that people know about uh, those who, those who don't, do not learn from history are condemned to repeat it. That's one version. The one I know is those who do not learn from history are doomed to hear other people reminding them of it all the time. Uh, but it's something that Americans should take more seriously. I mean, it's a very basic thing about human existence. How did we get here? If we understand how we got here, we'll understand better what we're doing and where we're going. That's not the American style anymore. So the TRC, Dickinson State, and symposiums like this, we're at the front line of it. We're in a, um, a pattern, really, to hold back. We're like King Canute trying to hold back the, uh, the ocean, but we can do it. Uh, but we should view it as a quest, not a mere hobby, I uh, suggest to you. Um, so four years ago, the theme of the symposium was World War I. So it's appropriate that we stop and uh, Jeffrey did talk about the war and the end of the war um, but a lot of Roosevelt's legacy is not just what he did during the before and during the war and in his last months uh, afterwards and fighting the League of Nations battles and all like that but in a real sense a lot of what he did and a lot of the seeds he planted are sprouting today for good or bad, so it's proper to have at least one talk, I suggest, about his legacy. Uh, 
and the anniversary of his death and the uh, the anniversary of the end of the war that we talked about it. I'm going to ask, we've taken a lot of hand votes today and you can call out answers if you have them uh, and not give me ballpark numbers. But how many, we just observed the anniversary of 9-11 18 years ago. How many, how many uh, victims of terrorism died on 9-11? 3,000? Okay. I'm going to disagree with you and stick with me for half a moment. Um, in my point of view, uh, three th approximately 3,000 people were not victims of terrorism on 9-11. They were victims of murder. The rest of us are the victims of terrorism. Our lives have changed. Our worldview has changed. Values are upside down. Terrorism... We're terrorized for a reason. It's not merely to stop some people from breathing. And I'm not being a school mom on this. I think it's very important in history and in current events to consider the meanings of words and the effects of words and policies. So I'm going to suggest we do that now. A couple other things about history. We know that we know that. I agree with it, of course, but the history is written by the victors. We've all heard that. Um, and we've also heard that the first casualty of war is truth. So that's the path I'm going to uh, go a little way today. Um, and I'm going to tell you, if any of you are particularly interested in World War I and Roosevelt with World War I, the books I reread... Um, to prepare for today. The Bugle That Woke America by Herman Hagedorn, 1940. Uh, we tend to, those of you who know Hagedorn's work at all professionally or his writing um, and his poems, um, we tend to take him for granted. But his books were very good. The first book that really turned me on to TR was The Roosevelt Family of Sagamore Hill. 1954, and it is a wonderful book, very well written and captures the spirit of the family. Well, The Bugle That Woke America was written in 1940, and it was frankly uh, an argument for America to in intervene in World War II, and he was cherry-picking things Roosevelt did and said to make that argument. Nevertheless, since he, he knew Roosevelt, maybe the best of all people in the last year of his life, it's very valuable for that. Never Call Retreat by J. Lee Thompson. I think he's been a guest here, has he? Um, I reviewed that for the um, TRA Journal, and uh, it has its points. Uh, the Pity of War by Niall Ferguson uh, is not specifically about Roosevelt, but brilliantly talks about the war and a lot of the misconceptions about World War I since then. The same thing, The Illusion of Victory by Thomas Fleming. Both those writers are revisionist historians about World War I. And I fall in with their lot. I think maybe the best might be Patricia O'Toole's When Trumpets Call. Michael Cullinane's book is not uh, so much about the war, but Roosevelt's ghost is wonderful. Uh, learned a lot from Jeff's book, uh, specifically this book of his, A Mad Catastrophe, uh, which really describes what, and I've come to believe, the most useless of all of history's most useless wars. It was uh, a stain on... on uh, on the human race. Of course, is uh, Edmund Morris's third book of the trilogy, Colonel Roosevelt. And then a book I particularly like and recommend to you called T.R.'s Last War by David Petruja, 19, excuse me, 2018, recent book. And I recommend a little bit of a tangent here, recommend the very short last chapter of that book to you, T.R.'s Last War, in which he speculates 
that Roosevelt, and he's taken Roosevelt through the teens and the reactions to the war and the battles, and including Roosevelt's health battles and everything. But he suggests, he doesn't claim, he suggests that TR committed suicide on January 6th. We know he couldn't walk across the bedroom anymore. Uh, he was alert enough to write a memo about 1920 presidential politics, but he was in pain and there was so much wrong. And he claims, this is an interesting thesis, maybe not for a full year symposium, but if you look at it, the Roosevelt family through several generations was marred by depression, alcoholism, and suicide. Uh, Roosevelt's uncle was involved in scandals. Roosevelt's brother uh, was a drunkard and had an illegitimate wife and uh, committed suicide. Uh, Roosevelt's son Kermit did. And he just made the point that as TR carried deadly doses of morphine in Brazil and in Cuba and in Africa in case he really needed to check out, uh, he speculates on whether that might have been the case in the lonely bedroom in Sagamore Hill in 1919. That's um, interesting. <laughs> we can go from there. Um, I'm going to give away, well, I have to give away, um, it's not a surprise, but as a reassessment of TR's wartime years, um, I will um, I'll tell you my family history briefly. I'm 100% German on both sides going back. You see the spelling of my name, that's German. My grandfather, who came to America in 1900, um, in the teens, experience in New York, in Queens, New York, uh, experienced such anti-German prejudice that he anglicized his name. But he was a feisty guy who, nevertheless, my father told me would sit on street cars, street cars snapping loudly his copy of the uh, Staatszeitung, the German newspaper, and such as that. But uh, there was intense German prejudice after the war, uh, during the war. And uh, I was uh, privy to a lot of that, and my family was in a unique position. Um, so a lot of that informed some of my views. It didn't make me pro-German. We've got to be agnostic about the issues of the war. I suggest 100 years later we should get over those issues. And someone referred earlier to the Belgian atrocities. There might have been Belgian atrocities, but it did come out afterwards that the stories of Germans bayoneting children for the fun of it in Belgium were nonsense. I mean, there was a lot of propaganda in the war. And um, whether that... Influ it did influence Roosevelt, whether it convinced him and he fell for it, or whether he wanted to use those propaganda arguments as a crutch. Uh, it dominated uh, American media and American public opinion eventually. TR had averted the Great War several times. He saw it coming. In one of my books, I call him the Great Anticipator. Uh, he saw crises, and there were a lot of American problems that I think we don't, we would never think as American problems because he anticipated them and planned and headed them off at the pass. I think that was one of the geniuses of Roosevelt. And we can't know them. We can't speculate on some, whether something would have arisen as, as a big uh, issue uh, or not. But whether it was the... Uh, in fact, the Venezuela crisis, because the Germans were trying to collect debts forcibly, and that actually um, inaugurated the Roosevelt corollary, uh, saying, okay, not only do you stay out of the Western Hemisphere, but we'll, we'll protect and become the collection agents with these countries. So that was Germany feeling frisky. 
uh, the Al Jazeera uh, conference that wasn't German, Germany on the verge of invading Morocco, but they were demanding trade rights. Britain and France were denying uh, Germany all rights of trade there. And Roosevelt, who could have said, you guys duke it out, he saw that as um, kindling of a potential uh, uh, wildfire. So there were times he did this, and Roosevelt was a, a really a genius at whether it was an uh, imperialist or not, or expansionist or not. He could see problems brewing and uh, uh, issues that could have grown that he just stepped in and took care of. It wasn't traditional for presidents to do it, and he did it. And that's something we, I think, don't always appreciate about Roosevelt. We can't always know, but we should be aware of their possibilities. So I think war was, Jeffrey makes this point brilliantly in his book that war was inevitable. Um, there were so many, you know, all those cousins, the monarchs were all cousins to each other. They were all fighting over borders, country versus country, language versus language. Uh, Catholicism versus Orthodox versus Muslim, uh, languages, of course. And at the time the war, in 1914, the Guns of August, there had already been two land wars smaller, 1912 and 1913, in the Balkans, short duration. And then when that war uh, broke out, as you all know, it was within a month the whole world, or at least all of Europe, was in flames. Um, but it was not inevitable that we intervene. We didn't have to. Uh, Roosevelt's first comment on the, on the daily declarations of war between these countries was, uh, or Belgium, when the German army passed through Belgium, he said something to the effect of uh, when giants wrestle, it's inevitable that Midgets get crushed or something like that, but we get his point. He didn't keep that point long. But we did hear some points raised, or you read them in history books, that uh, Wilson loved peace so much he thought we were above peace and there's no such thing as a bad peace. And um, America is too proud to fight. We know all of his phrases. We also know uh, that Wilson said before any of this happened, but he said it would be an I a supreme irony if it turned out that the main um, uh, aspect of my administration would be foreign affairs because he never cared about world history, about foreign affairs. I mean, he wrote books about America. Seriously, series of books about American history, and he taught American constitutional law. And he probably could not have located half the countries in the world on a globe and was almost proud of it. He just didn't want anything to do with it. But to say that we were not involved, um, I think, is a half-truth, because right away under Taft and the first two years under Wilson, the military budgets uh, decreased, maneuvers stopped, um, military maneuvers. Um, yes, the Army and Navy shrank in terms of number of, of peoples and, and vehicles and ships that were active. So it was Taft as well as Wilson. But were we involved, uh, not involved? No. In the last weeks of Taft's administration, our ambassador to Mexico was directly involved in the murder of Madera, the president. And we know about Taft's dollar diplomacy. We did throw our weight around. And if you view some of the things that Taft did and Wilson in his early months, uh, Roosevelt interpreting the, uh, the Panamanian um, provinces 800th Declaration of Independence, all of a sudden he recognized them. 
that looks clean and honorable compared to what America was doing month after month in Central and South America. Our hands were very dirty. William Jennings Bryan, when he was Secretary of State already, it's forgotten by history, but uh, he was involved in a financial scandal, allied with people trying to set up and, and strong arm the banks in the Dominican Republic um, to America's favor and, and people in America favorable to, to, the, to the Democrats. So there was a lot of that, and it's forgotten by history. One thing to pause for a second, it's not just cartoons, but I've been a collector and pack rat all my life. And uh, it's not just like, you know, other people collecting matchbooks or something like that. Uh, to have long runs of newspapers from the 1890s to the 1920s, complete runs of all the major New York newspapers and others, and magazines, Harper's Weekly, Leslie, Puck Judge and Life, and uh, Scribner's and all those magazines. Um, I don't collect just for the cartoons. I collect to know those issues better. And when you read the daily news bulletins and stories uh, about uh, details of history from those years, anyway, with me, it's often happened, and I was a history major and everything, I say, how come I never heard of this? Um, so, dig all you can, and as the digital archive gets fuller, comb it all you can. Um, it's amazing what we don't know, and a lot of it's because what we choose not to know. Uh, because uh, My guess is because of current prejudices, and we just look for facts to uh, support that. Um, but Taft's arbitration mania, uh, took hold. Roosevelt was not a fan from the start. Um, as I said, no maneuvers and stuff like that. And then Wilson, we were in a very funny position in 1914 when war broke out in Europe. Um, it wasn't just that Wilson thought it was not logical that we get involved. Um, he was never admitted to it, but in all, for all intents and purposes, a pacifist. Well, I was his right. William Jennings Bryan bragged about being a pacifist, the Secretary of State. The Secretary of War was a pacifist. Publicly bragged about it. Who would nominate a Secretary of War as a pacifist? Well, Wilson did. I mean, there's an irony in that. Um, uh, Secretary of the Navy, uh, Josephus Daniels, was a pacifist. So the policy that was developing and was rolling out as the world caught f f a flame was handled very strangely. I mean, at least you would say uh, it's all con counterintuitive. Uh, the other reason Wilson might have had the policies he did is that Europe and even South American countries declaring war on each other, an American island of non-belligerency. Um, prosperity, we went through a little uh, recession in 1913, but because of the war, almost instantly, our economy went through the roof. We had a bumper crop of, uh, uh, of uh, harvest in 1914, but American banks and American branches of, of British banks we're lending money to both sides, all sides, at exorbitant rates. And very quickly, the European countries were bleeding themselves dry. I don't know what kind of a poll it was, but after five weeks, there were articles that uh, the majority, I don't know, I'm, this is what was written, the majority of French soldiers wished the war would end. Five weeks. It went on four years. Uh, so the countries were being bled dry, going bankrupt, and they borrowed from American banks. So we were making out like bandits, and that was one reason to stay neutral. Uh, that's a little bit of a backstory there. Um, and they sort of ran the administration. Morgan, Rothschild, Kuhn Loeb, 
uh, had enormous influence, and eventually Bernard Baruch, when the war started, had had great role in the uh, war policies. Uh, did you set that clock ahead? When uh, it was going? Uh, how long are we going? And in conclusion, let me say. Um, so I'm suggesting to you that there was a lot of hypocrisy. Wilson wasn't a saint. Um, was Roosevelt or not? Behind the scenes, Wilson fav massively favored England and France. Uh, silent deals, assurances, like FDR was to do with Lendlease. We were, by law, neutrals, and yet we were sending ships and supplies and such as that. So that happened in World War II, uh, World War I also. And Wilson would send these notes to Germany, and I think Clay read some of Roosevelt's reactions to the diplomatic notes, and Wilson would say, we'll hold you in strict accountability and such. What does that mean? It means nothing. It means another note was, uh, was written. But something we should know is that America was being swayed by, bit by bit by uh, British propaganda because British the Brits owned all the transatlantic cables. All the German ones were cut. So the news we got was either British or German news that snuck through was censored or changed. Um, and the Brits were doing things like putting American flags on their ships to claim that if they were attacked by U-boats, uh, they were violating international law. They were putting munitions, tons and tons of munitions, on passenger ships. And before, you, you all probably know this, but before the Lusitania sale, there were ads in New York newspapers explaining to people on the travel pages of the newspaper that British ships have been known to uh, ferry mu munitions which is against international law, we will treat them as belligerent ships. You hereby warn that you're taking a risk if you sail on the ships. Does it make it right or wrong that they sank the Lusitania? I don't know, but Americans knew what they were risking by that. Um, also, the Brits a lot were stopping American ships, confiscating mail, our mail, uh, holding passengers hostages, always letting them go, but uh, that's largely forgotten by history, too. It's a two-edged thing, but that didn't upset uh, people as much. Um, and we'll talk about the state of TR at the time. Uh, he lost the Bull Moose uh, campaign, came in second, but after that, a lot of America just really considered him in the political graveyard. Uh, he thought he was done for. O.K. Davis has written, a, he wrote a book, uh, he was secretary of the Progressive Party, and he wrote a book, if you can find it, called Released for Publication. He had former New York Times reporter, became uh, secretary of the uh, Progressive Party, and in the mid-20s wrote a book, Released for Publication. And it was about, most fascinating, not about the formation of the party, or the, um, the people who were diehard bull moosers before it became fashionable. Um, but very interesting chapters on Roosevelt after 1912 and 1914 and beyond. A lot of times, first of all, Roosevelt felt honor bound to campaign for progressive candidates who had ruined their careers by leaving the Republican Party were involved in losing campaigns, but making the effort. And Roosevelt thought, he said to O.K. Davis, he said, I'm going to get out of politics, but I cannot let any of these people uh, hang without me. And sometimes they drove through the countryside, just the two of them, to very small campaign rallies, and hardly any progressives were elected in 1914. And then the two years after that, uh, Roosevelt still wrote books and 
uh, wrote for magazines and such, but he was really, he thought he was done forever. And um, that's where Roosevelt was. No one was listening to him, and he thought, and was mostly correct, that no one wanted to listen to this guy anymore. How does Kemble keep popping up here? Uh, that's how he was seen after the Bull Moose campaign. Who could put Humpty Dumpty together again? So when the war broke out, uh, he started to dissent from Wilson's policies. And they were not welcome speeches or articles. America was largely pacifistic, or at least non-interventionist. And that song, I Didn't Raise My Son, My Boy to Be a Soldier, was very popular. It gave, made Roosevelt's skin crawl. By the way, when war was declared and all the Roosevelt sons immediately volunteered, Edith Roosevelt <laughs> said something like, uh, I did raise my sons to be soldiers, but not the only ones. Um, but... Um, this is how he was uh, seen. The point of this cartoon is that he's a scold, he's a know-it-all. Uh, the world might be in trouble, but it doesn't look that welcoming of his efforts, his policies. I will save you. Um, and there was a lot of ego in his speeches. I know better, I know better. Um, so I have mostly... I'll tell you in, I guess, conclusion, um, or close to it. I have mostly a hagiographic view of Roosevelt. I approve of almost everything he did and half the things he didn't do. Um, I named my son Theodore. Here I am. I've, I've devoted a lot of my life to knowing, uh, uh, respecting him, knowing him, uh, trying to publicize them and everything. However, during these war years, as we see here, whoops, we know that, um, I think you've got my views a little bit on the war. Worst war, silliest, tragic, biggest mistake. And yet Roosevelt countering American public, public opinion that really did not want to go into the war uh, what do I think of Roosevelt persuading America otherwise? I can't imagine that he was fooled by British propaganda. I can't think as a student of history as he was that um, he didn't really understand the forces at hand. Uh, but nevertheless, he was head over heels uh, for the Allies and against the central powers. So for one little bit of Roosevelt's life and career, I dissent and I regret, and I think he was off the tracks then. But saying that at a Roosevelt Symposium, okay, we look at the warts and everything. But if we can get past that, and he lived in those days, and he had his respected historical threads and all like that, what I think we should take away from Roosevelt, and a lot of historians don't, is that it was maybe the most remarkable few years of his life. He didn't dig a new canal. He didn't overturn the federal government. But what he did between early 1915 and by the time we got into war, I say almost single-handedly, and I tell you having newspapers and magazines at the time and all like that, Almost single-handedly, he turned American public opinion around. He was a voice in the wilderness. Uh, okay, we'd talk about the Lusitania being sunk, but other than that, he would talk about issues, world politics, historical trends, uh, what-ifs about if this side won, if that side won. He'd talk geopolitics. And month by month by month, he started to persuade the American public uh, he doesn't, doesn't get enough credit for this, and if you want to say blame, but the point is he was a lone voice in the wilderness, and he was so effective. And how many people 
can do this. Now, we came very close to getting the Republican nomination in 1916, but there were a lot of resentments there. He had the progressive nomination, but he wouldn't take it because it would have meant the re-election of Wilson, and he was aghast at that idea. He would not let that happen if he could help it. So being a splinter candidate would have made that happen. But he came during those years. And then when Wilson uh, broke off diplomatic relations with Germany, three months after being reelected as he kept us out of war candidate. Um, OK, the Germans declared unrestricted submarine warfare again. But um, broke off relations in, 19, in February 1917 and asked for a declaration of war in April 1917. Almost every speech Wilson made, every press release, were phrases that Roosevelt had used the previous several years. So I make an argument that really for the first, really for the only time in American history, uh, Roosevelt, during those years, was the closest we've ever had to a shadow president. Now, constitutionally, we don't have a shadow president. Informally, parliamentary countries do. Um, Maybe formally, I don't know if Jeremy Corbyn has, has that title, but you know, they're shadow secretaries for um, every cabinet officer. So they become the spokesman of the opposition and everything. Well, usually in American history, it's been the losing candidate of a previous campaign or someone who's on the rise, uh, Daniel Webster, maybe Henry Clay, people like that. So they were in opposition, but they never actually played the role of when the president would make a speech, they'd make a speech almost immediately afterwards. When the president would have a declaration, point by point by point it would be answered. When the president would go on a speaking tour, not every tour, but that Roosevelt would follow him in a truth campaign from city to city. He never called himself a shadow president, but to me it's really fascinating uh, that before him, no one did that, served that function so effectively, or since. That really has not been the case. We've had uh, effective leaders in the opposition, but never a point by point as Roosevelt did. And it is a remarkable testament to not just his ideas or commitments, but honestly the force of his personality, that he attracted attention that he was willing to take vituperation. And we've mentioned the nonpartisan league. He made a point of going to German neighborhoods in the upper Midwest and in St. Louis and speaking in German neighborhoods to German crowds, taking it to his most predictable and vocal um, opponents. When he was sued for libel in uh, 1915 in New York, William Barnes, the Republican boss of New York, sued Roosevelt because he said that Barnes is a crook and uh, cooperates with Democrat bosses. Roosevelt won, but when the jury was uh, deliberating, or maybe in the last days before it went to the jury, the Lusitania was sunk. <laughs> and Roosevelt, against the advice of his lawyers and friends, uh, on the courthouse steps made public statements against the German Imperial Navy, against the Kaiser, and they said, half the, Syracuse, half the jury or German nationals uh, or immigrants, tone it down. He did not tone it down. It's not Roosevelt's style. He took it. He had a favorable verdict. But it was really remarkable what he did. It was very sacrificial. He didn't need to do it, even though he burned with a passion on the subject. He laid it all out there. When we went into the war, and very cruelly, we won't go into that, but Wilson refused his, um, not just uh, offers to have a Roosevelt division, but at every turn, um, slapped Roosevelt down. Uh, very petty, I think. Um, he did the same with Leonard Wood, who should have been, in, instead of Pershing, was in line to head the expeditionary force. And instead, Wilson 
uh, named him be uh, as a co uh, commander of Fort Frederick Funston, I think, in Kansas, uh, training soldiers because Wood happened to be pro-preparedness and started the Plattsburgh training camps and such. And um, it's a great cartoon in the last weeks of Roosevelt's life. The cartoonists just know this was happening. But one of Wilson's slogans was, he kept us out of war. Okay. So Boardman Robinson drew a cartoon of Leonard Wood and Theodore Roosevelt saying, well, he kept us out of war. <laughs> and between Quentin's death and how he was mistreated and mishandled by the administration at a time when they could have used him, uh, he had every right to be bitter. In a certain sense, he was. But it would be fascinating to speculate on where he would have stood on the League of Nations he was against Wilson's 14 points, but we can't hold that against him because most of you, I think, might know the, uh, the uh, characterization by Clemenceau of France, um, hearing about Wilson's 14 points. He said, Wilson and his f infernal 14 points. God Almighty only has 10. <laughs> And Roosevelt's proposed league to enforce peace, as it was originally proposed, uh, was very different than Wilson's um, League of Nations as proposed. But do we know whether he actually would have uh, opposed Wilson to the bitter end? Probably he hated him to the bitter end. Uh, he might have come up with a compromise, and Wilson might have been in a corner. Uh, Wilson made the 1918 midterm elections very personal. He didn't ask that he be, that uh, candidates for the Senate and House be elected who agreed with the war policies, the war ending just about an election day, or with a record of supporting the country or preparedness even as late in the day as Wilson did. No. He called for the election of a Democratic House and a Democratic Senate, which was a slap in the face to the Republicans who voted for war and supported the war uh, prosecution and everything. So he's very petty. And would Roosevelt have trounced him further and taken over, especially after Wilson had that stroke and people went for months not seeing him except in a darkened room and having his wife speak for him? There's so many what ifs we don't know. Uh, but what we do know is that Roosevelt was, and I hope we don't forget it, there's a lot of history books that he was more consequential and influential during that period when America was against the war to being persuaded to join the war and then the prosecution of the war. And Roosevelt hammered it. You know, we didn't have, do people know this? We didn't have a soldier in Europe 12 months after we declared war. Is that generally known? OK. Um, because we were so unprepared. And would Roosevelt have been precipitous? He was a great anticipator. If he had been president, he would have prepared a little better, whether formally declaring or not. He wouldn't have let it drift as Wilson did, we can assume that. Um, there are just so many what ifs connected with that that it's fascinating, but let us not forget how, to me, in certain ways, that was his shining hour that he was able to turn American public opinion on its head almost single-handedly. By the time war was declared, everyone was with him. I mean, half the country, all the Republicans but it wasn't that way beforehand. And then to close, and speaking about legacy, so I think his legacy is, among many other things, individuals count, stand up for what you believe in, and if you're in a position to write and speak and persuade your fellow citizens, follow Roosevelt's handbook. But wouldn't it be fascinating, it is fascinating if we would go home and think about this, or next year think about it. What if Roosevelt hadn't virtually killed himself in the, with a Brazilian jungle fever and all that he 
did and the crazy abuse of his body. What if he had lived to another 10 years, 1929? Would he have been elected? How in the world would he have dealt with prohibition and the jazz age and the gangster era? Really? Can we see it? Can we see Roosevelt? I mean, we, you know, Coolidge would dress in the funny Indian headdress and everything, but Roosevelt during the jazz age? Roosevelt talking about ragtime or Al Capone uh, weighing in on the Scopes trial? Um, if he handled the economy better, and we know he wasn't great about tariffs and economics, but his people probably would have been. Would the economy have done better? And what if there were no uh, depression in 1929? If he had lived in 1920, for sure, the Democrats would not have named the young, practically unknown Franklin Roosevelt on their ticket as vice presidential candidate. We know the only reason he was there is to get the magic name on uh, bumper strips. If they were bumper strips, they weren't. But history would have been so much different. Uh, depression or not, FDR might not have been in the White House. and. We can play what if about a lot of things. What if the British had slept late uh, at, at um, Bunker Hill or something like that. But the point about Roosevelt is, and I said in the last session, that he's baked into our culture now. And it's not a mere question of what if, but we know Roosevelt so well that if we know the issues of history so well, uh, we can learn a lot by speculating. It's not a parlor game and we can learn things about ourselves and going forward and call each other Ted Heads proudly. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, let me just stop this cartoon. Did we show this yesterday? <clears throat> uh, after he died, an American boy saying, I wish I could be like him. Isn't that great? And then this is a painting I did a number of years ago. That it's your painting. Yeah, my painting, yeah. Another of your talents. <laughs> yeah. um, so, you. just have a little bit of time here. So, you said a couple of really intriguing things. You said you announced that you're nearly a hagiographer, that you, a hagiographer is someone who believes that someone's a saint. A or, saint, yeah. And so, saint, <laughs> saints' lives. Yeah. Uh, you said nearly so. Um, and so almost anything I'm going to say is going to look bad, I mean, if that's your view. But mm. uh, you said, but this was the one time you were disappointed in him. And what exactly were you disappointed in? Well, I think, um, to me, and knowing history of the times, as I think I do fairly well, um, he, he fell for propaganda easily. I mean, a lot of it was palpably wrong. And we know first casualty of war is true. He knew that. And yet he, he uh, advanced the, uh, uh, the propaganda lines. A neighbor of his, J. Stuart Blackton, I'm working on middle burners, not back burners, but middle burners, two books on Roosevelt. One is fiction that if Lincoln had not been assassinated uh, 20 years later, another secession movement and Lincoln was brought out of retirement and he needed a right-hand man and a young Theodore Roosevelt helps the old Abe Lincoln save America for the second time around. So that's one of my books. But the other one is a book on Roosevelt's faith. And we touched on it before. And it is a very uh, deep well to drink from. Uh, and of all topics, he was very modest about very uh, uh, circumspect and private about it. But there's a lot of evidence that he was a man of uh, deep faith. But about on this subject, um, it's just to me very hard to believe that with all his connections and all his knowledge of history and keeping in touch with current events, not just through his friends like Sir Edward Gray and everything, that he fell for such ridiculous propaganda stories. His neighbor, that was the reason I thought about the books. And another book I'm writing is a, I'm going to have a figure. J. Stuart Blackton is the main character. He was a cartoonist. He helped invent animated cartoons, and he was also a movie producer. And uh, 
so he's going to be the central character in his book, but he was a neighbor of T.R. in Oyster Bay. And in 1915, he produced the movie called The Battle Cry of Peace, uh, really about what would America go like if we were invaded and lost to Huns. They weren't called Germans, but they obviously were with the helmets and everything. Roosevelt uh, backed it financially. Uh, he got a lot of his friends to back it. He endorsed it as like, you know, one of 12 quotations. He thought he would hurt the cause if he were too publicly identified with it. But it was out and out propaganda about the enemies of America. And this was in 1915, two years before we got into the war. But he was already assuming who our enemies were and would be. And I'm just disappointed that, in, to me, he just didn't um, consider the issues more carefully and maturely. So, okay, so uh, fair enough. But then you also then closed by saying it's amazing how much impact and influence he had to push America into the war or, or, or to build support for it. Yeah. So on the one hand, you're saying that he was kind of allowed himself to be duped in a war that there was no good guy or bad guy. It was just yeah. a really bad thing. Yeah. And then, but then you're sort of giving him high praise for stirring the country into the war that you're saying that he was duped into taking the yeah. one side. That's all I'm doing. I guess what I criticize in others, and I hope I'm not doing but a little bit, I am being an armchair um, psychologist. And I'm trying to thread the needle between what I think is a mistake he made in terms of policy, if we can wash that out of the discussion, discussion just an appreciation of what he did as, as a personality and was able to do almost a superhuman first lonely uh, effort. And it's almost unprecedented in American history as well as uh, maybe not world history, but of all I know, uh, he was very lonely at first. Let me ask one last question and see if the audience has some. But I, from someone who is not particularly a hagiographer, might say that no president has ever treated his successor worse than Roosevelt treated Wilson. Irresponsible, mean, spirited, ad hominem, cheap shots, um, using his immense authority and credibility to be savage to a person who was doing his best to steer America through a very difficult time. Um, how do you respond to that? Because, I By mean, disagreeing with you. You do disagree with it. Yeah, I think he did, Wilson deserved all that. Well, it doesn't matter whether he deserved it. <laughs> yeah. But I mean, I'm, I'm sure that G.W. Bush has things to say about his successor. Presidents, generally speaking, try hard to uh, be deferential to those who follow them. OK, that's a good point. He only used, started using those types of terms about Taft when they were in the primaries, not before him. As a matter of fact, all through the end of 1911, a lot of newspaper editorial writers, a lot of politicians. He was claimed by both sides. A lot of the conservatives thought he was still going to rescue the old guard, believe it or not. Uh, so then after, after the primaries, after he declared, and this is not written about a lot too, but Taft's people totally savaged Roosevelt, accused him of uh, dishonesty and fraud uh, during the 1907 uh, Wall Street crash and right. Standard Oil profited and all like that. And um, that's one reason Roosevelt struck back. And then also, also not known, but the Taft administration tried to give away the majority of Alaska to the Guggenheim uh, oil interests. I don't know if Guggenheim's were in oil anymore. Uh, the kind of grease, no, I don't know. Um, but those reasons, it wasn't just ego or or he had his Nostalgia reasons. for his office, so he had reasons. And I think he did with Wilson uh, pretty much from the start. I think he was just more colorful than he needed to be, but he uh, was TR. I'm surprised he was surprised when Wilson turned him down on that last uh, Rough Rider run. <laughs> um, thoughts, uh, questions from the audience? We have about four minutes here. Yes, go ahead. Any questions? How does he react to the coming of the penny press and the yellow journalism and, the, yeah. and the, the great rise of media in his time? Yeah. Um, he played them like a fiddle. 
Uh, for one thing, by the way, the Herald Tribune only became a paper in 1924. It was two papers before then they merged. Um, but the, pa the other papers, the Yellow Press and Penny Press, you'd be referring to, were principally Pulitzer and Hearst. And they were both Democrat in the um, 1890s. Yellow journalism, sensationalism. We have a front page out in the display case. Um, up to that period in the 1890s, newspapers were, they were called tombs, excuse me, tombstones. A gray type, very narrow, no illustrations. And then Hearst printed in, I think, 128 point type, war. Um, and they sold millions of copies a day. Those two papers were anti-Roosevelt. But, when I say played like a fiddle, his best friends were newspaper men. He gave a lot of um, exclusives behind the don't quote me but, and all that business. And um, he, the editorial pages might be against him. Excuse me, the news columns and edit, thinking of Wallace, the way he talked about the publishers, editors, and truck drivers. Um, but Roosevelt had a lot of friends and a lot of sympathy amongst the press. And uh, some of the cartoons that were anti, well, we talked about the anti-Roosevelt, the cartoonists would see him two days later and they'd go hiking together or something like that. So he dealt with it okay. And I think, I think on balance, he thought he was probably treated better than badly. He gave the press their first room in the White House. Yes, that's right. He created the Ananias Club, which allowed him to banish those reporters that he felt had uh, betrayed yeah, him liars. off the records. Yeah. In the last three or minutes, you've said you're writing three books. Mm. And one wants to be skeptical, except that you've written 70. So mm. uh, how do you do this? How do you do this? Uh, well, it was 70 the other day. It's 74 now. It yeah, is, it's yeah. A, the weekend, you know? <laughs> how do I do it? It's easy. I you want to know? Yeah. Okay, I sit at my desk. In, in two and a half minutes. And I look at the pile, how high the pile of bills are. Mm -hmm. And that's my motivation. I don't know. I'm, don't the Chinese have a saying, it's a curse to live in interesting times. May you times. live in interesting times. May you yeah. live in interesting times. I just, my books are not all about, it's the popular culture, mostly. So some are Christian books and, and, and such are children's books. But otherwise, it's... Um, Journalism, uh, books about uh, uh, movies, television history, country music, uh, biography of Johann Sebastian Bach. Um, so it's just that I'm, and I work on books simultaneously when I'm blessed to have contracts. Uh, and it just keeps me fresh. It's like uh, different courses of a meal or something like that. And uh, that's how. And some of this is fiction? Actually, no, not no, yet. Not. The only fiction I've written so far have been uh, uh, tax forms and expense uh, reports. <laughs> and well, it's just so easy uh, <laughs> to set you up. Uh, so, if you I oh, by the way, no, I've written hundreds of comic book stories. I was editor of Marvel Comics, and I worked for Disney. So that's fiction too, but it's like you know with animals, talking so you're, animals. You're a hagiographer of TR. Are there other figures that you feel equally passionate about yeah. positively? Yeah. Benjamin Franklin and uh, Charles Lindbergh. 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 Our neighbor in Minnesota. There you go. And, and uh, collector of and if, archives and This is a, and such, a, yeah. a mean question, but if, if you only got to put one of, of your 70 books in a time capsule that's your book, what book is it? I would say bully, but it's sold out now, so there's no reason to. Uh, yeah. um, I, honestly, the ones I'm proudest of that could be buried with me would be Bully or a book I wrote called America's Great Comic Strip Artists, uh, Abbeville Press, and uh, the biography of Bach. That came out all right. I was happy with that. Yeah. Our dear friend, Rick Marshall. Thank you.